Hi there, I'm Krishna and I'm a language lover. Today I would like to talk about rotics, that's the R sounds or R sounds in human languages uh, that many people struggle with and I thought I would just make a comparison of the world's rotics, um, how they are used and what rotics they are. First I would like to emphasize that I see three basic versions of R sounds that sometimes can, uh, sometimes the borders are not very clear and still there I see three basic versions of uh, R sounds. First the trill, tap or flat sounds like for example the Spanish R, R like in perro which means dog or the flap sound R like in Spanish pero which means but. Then we have the approximants as a second uh, version of R sounds, like the British red, R, red, or the American red, red. And finally, we have the third group, which are the uvular R sounds, like in French rouge or in German rot, which are the uvular sounds made at the back of your mouth with the uvula. First I ask the question why there are so many different rotics or why they have so many different forms and uh, one important thing to know about rotics is that they are more easily defined by their function or place in a syllable than by their phonetic properties. That means they usually appear in a certain place of syllables um, but their properties how they sound as you just heard is can vary quite a lot. Rotics can appear at the end of onsets and at the beginning of codas, which means I, you see here CRVRC, that's actually um, an abbreviation for um, any kind of syllable which first has a consonant, then it could have an R sound, a rotic, then it has a vowel, then again it could have a, a rotic and then the last consonant of the syllable. So this means that R's can appear in front or after uh, the main vowel or vowels in a syllable. I just uh, chose two examples of five different European languages. It's always the same word, once the word for grey and once the word for tart. So in English you can see grey, in German grau, in French gris, in Spanish gris, gris in Italian grigio which all means grey and you see that the R appears after the first consonant and in front of the vowel. Then uh, we have the word for tart, tart in German torte, in French tart, in Italian tar in Spanish tarta and in Italian torta. So in all of these languages the R appears after the main vowel and in front of the consonant. The most common rotic among human languages is the alveolar trill, r, r sound. Um, you find it in a wide variety of languages all over the world. I just chose some, for example, Russian, ruski, which means Russian, Spanish, raro, which means rare, Italian, carro, which means a cart or wagon, and Finnish, rakkaus, which means love. In most languages, the flap R, er, ara, ara, is actually a common variant of a trill because it's a, actually a fast way to say r, ra. Um, but there are a few languages where there is actually meaning difference, a contrast between ra and ra, like in Spanish that we already saw, like pero and perro but also in languages like Armenian or Albanian and some others. Japanese actually only has one rotic, which uh, appears, for example, in the word kokoro, which means heart or mind, or Korea, Korean um, in arirang, which is a very famous uh, place and song as well. And you can hear it's kind of a bit a mixture of an r sound and an l sound. R sounds, as uh, varied as they are, can also be pronounced differently depending on where they appear in a word. And which is quite common actually is the devoicing 
of a rhotic at the end of a syllable, so the r becomes a r, or the um, r would become a r. You see this uh, with the flap that an r become can become devoiced at the end of a syllable, r. For example, in Turkish, bir, which means one, or in Icelandic, thrir, which means three. The second version of erotics are the approximants, both the alveolar and post-alveolar approximants. Um, they are often sometimes also a variant of a trill, so some languages have either r or r. For example, British English has right, so the tongue only approaches the alveolar rig, but it doesn't touch it. Armenian has a such which means coffee, and Maltese has ashra, which is a, another way of saying ashra. So um, you can see this is this kind of English sounding R. Some languages have this R only at certain places. For example, Dutch can have uh, the alveolar approximant at the end of a syllable, like maar, which means but. The second variety of the rhotic approximant is the retroflex approximant, R. It's similar to the alveolar approximant, but the tongue goes further back in the mouth, R, R. The American R is also often rounded, so R. You see my lips are rounded as well. So actually the difference between a typical British R and an American R are quite big, if you listen closely. So it's right in English, but right, right in American. Mandarin Chinese, for example, also has the retroflex approximant, ren, which means person or man. Malayalam has vari, vari, which means way. And Swedish has rat, rat which means right or just. And in several of these languages, the retroflex approximant can even become more of a sibilant, that means a retroflex syllable, sibilant, which would be a r, for example, run in Chinese, or a rat in Swedish. Then they are almost, it becomes an S sound. Retroflex Rotics can also influence the consonants that follow them. So there can be a retroflexing of following consonants in languages like Swedish or Norwegian. Um, for example, in the Swedish word jord, jord, you don't really hear the R anymore, but the D has become a D, so the, it's, uh, it gets pronounced further back in the, on the upper part of your mouth. Or in Norwegian, you can say vashosnil, So the R and the S together become like a sh sound. That's a retroflex sh sound, vashosnil. Now we come to the third version of rotics, which are the uvula rotics. You either have the uvula trill, where the uvula is swinging, or the uvula approximant, which is more of a rasping sound. Um, I don't know of any language that distinguishes these two sounds. So, uh, I would say the uvula approximant is more common because it's more easy to pronounce, but a uvula trill can appear in many languages as well. For example, in French, German, and Dutch, you have the word for red is rouge in French, rot in German, or rot in uh, Dutch. In Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian, uh, at least in some dialects of Swedish and Norwegian, they also have the uvula approximant, like uh, the word for red again is rød in Danish and rød in some Norwegian dialects. Also Yiddish and Hebrew uh, have the uvula approximant, like rosh, which means head. And Portuguese has a version, uh, if in the at the beginning of this uh, word, or if you have a double R, then it's garu. That's also the uvula approximant, garu. 
as I have already mentioned uh, with the flap sounds, also the uvula erotics can become devoiced, so a r becomes a ch, and this is next, usually the case next to an unvoiced consonant, so after or in front of an unvoiced consonant. For example, in German, the word for tram or tramway is tram, so the r becomes a ch, tram, or in French, same word, tram, tram. Uh, also, after a vowel, tart, the r becomes a ch, la tart. In some languages like uh, British English or German, um, the r can also have an effect on the vowel that precedes it. Uh, in this case, it makes it longer, so there's a lengthening of a vowel. For example, in British or Australian English, you say hard or hard. So you don't really hear the r distinctly anymore, but the R, the R sound gets lengthened. In German and Danish, for example, you have it too. So va means um, it, he was, va, or in Danish er, um, is. So the vowel gets lengthened and the R is not really audible anymore. As a language nerd that I am, I found it actually quite interesting how such a rare sound in human language as the uvula R could become so widespread in quite some languages in Europe and so also worldwide. And actually Trudgel, um, a scientist, uh, was making a survey about this in 1974 and he made this map where you find the uvula R. And he found out that it probably spread from the from Paris, from the Paris region, the R, and it spread first through France, then also to, through Belgium and Germany, into Switzerland and to Denmark, and from there on to the south of uh, Sweden and Norway, also to the south of the Netherlands and even into Italy. Um, on this map you can see my uh, country where I come from, Luxembourg, which is not uh, colored yet. And I remember some of my, the people who lived in my village still pronounced the R in a R version, but nowadays it's almost disappeared. So the transformation from alveolar trill R to R is an ongoing process actually. In the Netherlands still you sometimes hear people who in one sentence use R and in one sentence use R. They are often not aware of it but I find it a very fascinating process how a sound can propagate through uh, through uh, yeah different countries and also the Hebrew R used to be an R like 10, 100 years ago when they started to use Hebrew as an everyday language in Israel. Uh, but nowadays the uvula version also is more common. So actually so far the uvula R is still spreading. I've just mentioned the case of Dutch, which is quite a special uh, case because it has all three versions of the rotic sounds. Um, one can distinguish between a Flemish Dutch, and which is spoken in Belgium, and uh, Netherlands Dutch or Netherlandic. In Flemish, the usually the people usually use the alveolar trill, rrr, but word finally they voice they devoice it so it becomes. Rrr. In the Netherlands, you find the uvular variant r or rrr more often, but at the end of a syllable, there's both the r and the r sound. Um, the alveolar version of r also exists, and still, world finally, you sometimes find r and you find r. So, which means that a single word as uh, rare, rar, or rare, rar, um, which means strange in Dutch, it doesn't really mean rare really, but it means strange, uh, can actually have five different official versions of being pronounced. I will read them aloud. So first uh, to uh, the Flemish one, raar, then the Dutch ones, raar, 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 and raar. In the Netherlands you can, and in the Belgium, you can hear all five versions of this. Another Im interesting language for me is Portuguese, which is spo spoken both in uh, the European country of Portugal, but also in the South American country of Brazil by a much larger group of people still. Um, in Portuguese, the normal R sound is usually a flap, ar, ra. For example, in the word for heart, coração, 
Curaçao. But in Portugal, you also have the uvula version, usually word, word initially, so in the beginning of a word, or if it's written with two R's, for example, we saw already carro, or which means car, or rato, which is a rat. And in Brazilian still, you have those versions, but sometimes an R can even become from a R to a H. It has really changed to a H sound, hatu, as far as I'm informed. There's another interesting phenomenon about rotics that I wanted to talk about. Um, there are several languages in the world where the R sound can be a vowel. So it's the center of a syllable. For example, this happens in uh, Slavic languages like Slovene, Serbo-Croatian or Czech. In these languages, uh, the word for heart is srce, srce. So you hear that actually the word is, the, the accent lies on an R. In Sanskrit, uh, the old Indian language, there is a retroflex R sound that can be treated as a vowel and it also occurs in my name, uh, which is Gurshna, Gurshna. So the vowel is R, R. And it's, uh, it's the name of a god, but it also means blue in Sanskrit. A final thought about rotics is that, especially in Asian languages, um, R sounds and L sounds get sometimes mixed or treated as one single sound. Um, so for example, in Japanese, uh, there is no difference between R and L. So also when Japanese have to uh, translate English words or words from other languages, there sometimes they just mix these two sounds, but it's because there is only an R sound, which somehow lies between an R sound and an L sound. R. In Korean as well, the, this letter that you see is pronounced word initially R as a flap and word finally as an L, so a liquid sound. So for example, I put the word cola there, which is just the word for Coca-Cola, for cola, cola. Note that um, I transcribe it as col ra because the second r sound would be pronounced r if there wasn't an l sound before so that's how they make colla arirang for example as i already mentioned has these two sounds at the beginning of a syllable so they become flaps other asian languages like thai or mandarin or some others um they sometimes do confound it um and still all these languages officially have different sounds, different words that differ com um, considering L or R sounds. Um, I sometimes even wonder myself where that comes from, but there is, there is sometimes a confusion going on. In European languages and many other languages, you usually have both an rhotic and a liquid in most languages. Yeah, so here we go again. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for watching my video about rotics. Um, if you still have questions, please put your questions in the comments because I found out that I actually uh, enjoy answering uh, questions of you. You asked some quite interesting questions. I also learned something thanks to your questions. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time. Bye bye.